Welcome to Never Again Is Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I'm Evelyn Marcus. And I am Phyllis Simbler-Miller. It is common notion that German Jews did not resist their persecution during the 12-year Nazi rule in Germany. Our guest today, after 12 years of academic, academic research, upends this notion of passive Jews in Hitler's Germany and expands the concept of resistance. Wolf Gruner is originally from Germany. He's currently a professor in Jewish studies and a professor of history at the University of Southern California, where he's also the director of the Center for Advanced Genocide Research. And he's a member of the Academic Advisory Committee of the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Wolf, thank you so much for coming on our show. Um, it's really thrilling to have you on with all your expertise on this topic. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's uh, really exciting to talk to you. Thank you. So you recently published a book, Resistors, How Ordinary Jews Fought Persecution in Hitler's Germany. Why did you want to write this book? Uh, yeah, so this is the book, just kind of doing some... Uh, kind of promotion. Uh, self promotion. Yeah. Um, good. So there are two answers a long answer and a short answer. So maybe I start with the longer answer. Um, I was trained in Germany as an historian of institutions and uh, worked a lot on kind of municipalities and their initiative role uh, in the persecution of the Jews. And what I've uh, realized doing my research is that these policies were very diverse. So there was not this, what we usually think, top-down policy from Berlin. A lot of the initiatives actually came from city governments. And so I was then starting to be interested in how these, uh, how the Jews actually responded to these very diverse policies, because they were different in Frankfurt, in Berlin, in Hamburg. They targeted the different elements of the Jewish population. And uh, so this kind of created my interest in Jewish reactions and responses in Nazi Germany. The short answer is, uh, I um, before I was uh, coming to Los Angeles, uh, I was hired in 2008. Uh, I uh, decided to take a few months off because I always wanted to have a look, a more systematic and uh, intensive look at a source nobody really had used for the persecution of the Jews. And these were police logbooks in the Berlin Landesarchiv. Um, and I had them used them for an earlier book for a very limited uh, time period in 1943, and I found them an incredible source. So I took these months off and thought I will find traces of persecution. So how on the ground in Berlin Jews were persecuted. And then uh, it happened. One of the first things among like th uh, thousands of records of policemen riding down stolen bicycles, drunk people and everything. There was this first uh, uh, note about uh, political offense. And this was actually a, a public protest by a Jewish man in Berlin. And I thought, I, at the time I was like, uh, I had 20 years of research already on my, uh, under my belt, focusing on the persecution of the Jews. And I never had kind of uh, came across such a document. And uh, what we didn't mention is I came from, uh, I grew up in East Germany, so I grew up in a dictatorship. So for me, uh, uh, I was aware that resistance uh, is not just armed resistance or group resistance. In East Germany, people were punished for speaking up, for example. And so in the moment I saw this document, I realized I never had thought that this is actually also true for Nazi Germany, that uh, people were punished for very small things, which the Nazis perceived as resistance. And so I started to dig more, found more of these uh, police notes, and then this is kind of uh, where they uh, all took off and uh, ended in the book I just showed. That's a remarkable history of uh, the writing of the book. You, you, after all your years of studying uh, Nazi Germany and the persecution of the Jews, 
mainly directing at directed at insti- the role of institutions you you came across a note in an archive that described a personal individual protest so to speak yeah. and you looked for more and you found more right yeah and so, our idea of, oh sorry no and so your book talks about five jewish individuals do you want to tell us about them please and how they stood up against persecution? Yeah, so uh, uh, when I started to uh, dig more, I found uh, like hundreds and hundreds of cases. First, mostly in the records, which I looked at, police records and court records, uh, these were Jews speaking up against persecution or insulting Hitler. Uh, And then I started to branch out from Berlin to other cities, and there I, uh, I saw that not only speaking up was a form of uh, individual resistance, um, but also other kind of uh, uh, acts. Um, and so uh, I kind of structured the book into five different categories of individual resistance. And I think this is the contribution of the book is really to think about resistance as performed by individuals and not by groups on not be armed. And so each story in the book uh, is representative for one type of resistance, which I kind of kind of created the category for. So the first story is about um, David Bornstein. He was uh, from Hamburg. He was a small merchant. And I found uh, a file in the archive where he was uh, put on trial because he tried to destroy a swastika on a public bus. And now, again, this was, again, striking because I was never aware that th- things like this actually happened. Do you, um, what, could you tell us what year this is, just so our audience has a feel? So in general, all these uh, kind of uh, traces of individual resistance, they start in 1933 and they end late into the war. I mean, when the deportation happened. So this is ongoing for all the time. And interestingly, it's not like more in the beginning and then it kind of, uh, decrease it later on. It is much more waves reacting towards special laws or violent events like Kristallnacht and so on. So, so, so between in, 1933, 1945, basically. Yeah. And okay. uh, in, in this, so there's never kind of a stop or a slowdown or anything. Yeah. So that's also remarkable, I think, uh, because we've previously assumed that, uh, with the increasing persecution, Jews try to adapt and that's kind of like, uh, minimized potential for resistance. So in this case, this was an early uh, uh, act of resistance um, in 1936. So, uh, and it happened, as I said, in Hamburg, and uh, he kind of scratched, kind of scratched with his uh, cane, with his walking stick, the uh, logo at the uh, public bus at the terminal at the outskirts of Hamburg. And uh, he was, uh, and this is really also uh, remarkable, any kind or type of these um, or any kind of this individual resistance was punished by the Nazis, and so that's how I also found these sources. Yeah, because uh, mm-hmm. uh, usually this is another kind of twist. We thought we can uh, actually trace Jewish actions mainly by looking into Jewish sources like ego, ego documents and so on. But the majority, <laughs> interestingly, of my um, uh, kind of, of my evidence is coming from perpetrator sources. And uh, the others, other personalities in your, or persons yeah. in, your, in your book, there, there are four more, right? Yeah. So the first one uh, stands for kind of what I call challenging or contesting Nazi propaganda, anti-Jewish propaganda. And it, in, uh, and what I do in the book is not only telling one story in detail, but also to add to every st- uh, chapter uh, kind of uh, other examples so that we uh, that actually a picture uh, emerges that this was not just an, an isolated individual act it was the tip of the iceberg right. and uh, so the second uh, chapter is about this what I mentioned earlier speaking up in public protesting in public um, uh, in front of passers-by sometimes officials it happened on the street, it happened in restaurants, it happened in uh, in uh, the neighborhood, in offices. And the story I tell here is from Henrietta Schaefer. 
she was uh, in a uh, lived in a mixed marriage in Frankfurt, and she uh, was a very quiet woman. She was like in I think in her fifties, if I remember correctly, and um, never had a conflict with the law or anything. And then, uh, with the increasing persecution of the Jews, uh, uh, the uh, pogrom. Uh, uh, in November 1938 happened to Kristallnacht. And this must have kind of uh, was, uh, been the last straw for her. The next morning, she goes out into the street and um, uh, enters a shop and uh, ask the shop owner if what the shop owner is uh, kind of saying about the violence of this night that uh, synagogues were burned, burned and shops destroyed. And the shop owner responded in a way like the Nazi propaganda saying, oh, this is the outrage of the German people. Um, this is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, nobody can do anything. It was just this kind of chaotic outburst. And then she said, no. This was not the people. This was the Nazi government, the damned government. This was Hitler. And this is kind of all the fault of the Nazi government. So and then she started to curse um, and said, uh, if I could, I would poison them all. Yeah. So uh, she, again, would, was put on trial for this and uh, went to jail for this comment. And this is only uh, one small kind of um, uh, example of also, again, dozens and dozens of uh, uh, public protests, public critique, uh, either against Nazi legislation like the race laws or specific laws against professions or violent events like uh, kind of anti-Jewish demonstrations and so on. So this is uh, again kind of represented. The third a category is um, the defiance or the disobedience of Nazi regulations, Nazi laws, anti-Jewish legislations, including also local restrictions. I mentioned earlier that city governments were very kind of uh, uh, often forerunners, actually, and sometimes Berlin was picking up ideas from the ground in, in these cities. So in this case, um, the story uh, uh, I tell here is uh, a 17 year old boy, Hans Oppenheimer, he, uh, uh, as many Jews at his age in 1939, so after Kristina, had already uh, was forced to perform forced labor as a 16 year old boy. What city was he in? In Frankfurt. Uh, and then he is, um, uh, he uh, uh, is brought back from a labor camp. So imagine, in, with 16 year old, uh, he's 16 year old, already four months in a labor camp, then again in another labor camp, so almost a year of heavy forced labor. Um, so with no kind of future in Germany, uh, uh, he comes back to Frankfurt and has to do other forced labor for the city. And uh, he decides to act. Uh, and this is at the end of 1940. So this is way into the war. And uh, what he does is he breaks the uh, curfew for Jews every night, uh, which was introduced at the beginning of the war. So Jews had, couldn't, were not allowed to enter the street after 8 p.m. So he goes out every night. And uh, at this time, the Allied uh, uh, bombing campaigns over Germany had started. So he waits for the Allied bombers to kind of close in. And when they start to drop their bombs, uh, he set uh, he sets off wrong fire alarms to distract or divert the firefighters from the actual kind of uh, bombing targets, the actual bombing sites from the burning houses. Amazing. Uh, and uh, he does this dozens of times. Um, he is then caught in a trap because after a while, after he does uh, did this, uh, uh, the Gestapo was trying to get a hold of him. Because of the curfew, he couldn't go far from his house. So it was all in his neighborhood. Uh, the, the Nazis then put him on trial and uh, he was uh, charged with uh, uh, a dozen attempts. However, the indictment actually says he's probably responsible for way more because there was a series of wrong fire alarms in uh, the two months from uh, November till December 1940 in his neighborhood, uh, over 40 attempts. 40. And then uh, this series stopped when he was arrested. 
but they could not prove this. And that's why he was charged only with a dozen attempts. He also, he was then getting a really heavy sentence of three years and suffered tremendously in jail uh, because he was put on uh, in isolation uh, from the very start. He was not allowed to uh, have contact with other prisoners. And th remember, he was just 17, uh, at the point in time after the trial, he was 18 years old. So um, his act was also unexpected for me when I found this, that uh, kind of this way of acting against uh, the persecution was very, uh, kind of uh, surprising. Um, and he stands for all of those who uh, kind of resisted, disobe uh, uh, were disobedient uh, against Nazi laws in different ways, breaking curfews, uh, very simple, you may uh, also, everybody knows, not wearing the star was also disobedience. However, nobody really uh, uh, has in mind that many people actually got arrested and went to jail for not wearing the star. This was punished. Uh, and was perceived as an act of resistance by the Nazis. So this is the category like disobedience of Nazi laws. The fourth one is uh, the written protest. Uh, and this kind of has a range from what we often really neglected, uh, these were petitions. So in Germany, one form uh, of protest against the state, which was enshrined in the constitution were petitions. However, we knew that Jews wrote hundreds and hundreds of petitions. You can find them in any uh, every archive in Germany. But we always neglected them as kind of written in vain because we thought the Nazis were not kind of responding to them. They didn't take them seriously. And they were also only focusing on kind of getting liberated from certain uh, kind of rules or ex uh, kind of excused from certain Nazi regulations. However, these petitions actually demonstrate a certain form of protest because in these petitions, Jews wrote a kind of made statements uh, about their patriotism, that they were kind of uh, also taxpayers, that they contributed to Germans kind of rise um, and that they fought in the first world war for Germany. Uh, and not only this, they also with this, they actually reclaimed, so to speak, their citizenship, which the Nazis kind of tried to deny them. Um, so we have uh, these forms and the story uh, which I, uh, oh, and then this goes from these petitions, which is the more public and uh, kind of accepted form. And interestingly, uh, uh, many petitions were actually received responses. They sometimes saved the petitioner because when they were in protest, uh, later on in the war, people were not deported because they waited for the outcome of the petition. Yeah, um, and then, but the range is from these official kind of channels like petitions to anonymous leaflets. So the story in the book is about uh, anonymous postcards written by a former real estate broker who was over 60 years old in Munich. And um, he, uh, he was getting kind of more desperate or throughout the 1930s because his uh, children who were over 20 years old, they had emigrated to the United States. And they, uh, he and his wife, they tried to emigrate to the US, but were, uh, kind of had a high number, they couldn't leave and were kind of trapped in Germany. And uh, throughout the 1930s, the children married, got kids and they could not participate in this. So they got more and more frustrated, tried to get out by any means, didn't, couldn't. And then the war started. And this was practically the end of any attempt to get out. And so uh, when the Yellow Star was introduced, this, I think, was the breaking point for um, uh, uh, Bruce Neuberger. This was the name of the uh, former real estate broker. He then started to uh, write, uh, uh, to take postcards put Hitler stamps on them, and then right over the Hitler stamps, kind of nasty, uh, insulting comments. And some of them are quite prophetic because one of them was, for example, Hitler, the mass murderer of 5 million. And he wrote this practically while in the East there were, uh, was mass killing going on uh, or started in the Soviet Union, in the occupied Soviet Union. But in Germany, this was not common knowledge at the time. So he does this 
several months uh, until he, he gets caught. And in his case, this was perceived as, interestingly, treason. <laughs> um, uh, although Jews were perceived as non-Germans, right? So it's kind of an interesting twist. He was put on the people's court uh, in a trial um, at the People's Court in Berlin, and some of you might know the People's Court was this notorious anti-Semitic, anti a Nazi kind of propaganda instrument. So he was moved from Munich to Berlin, and then he uh, was uh, punished with the death penalty, and he was executed, uh, uh, kind of beheaded uh, in November 1942. Uh, so he kind of suffered greatly from writing these uh, insulting comments on these postcards. And they only found him because he, unfortunately, he made one tiny mistake. He, uh, he took a postcard from his former real estate firm. And that's how he, the Gestapo, Gestapo got a hold of him. Uh, so Amazing. he stands, yeah, he stands uh, practically for this type of kind of written protest uh, and critique or insulting the Nazi government in uh, in writing. Yeah, and the last um, a chapter is uh, a very unexpected or was an unexpected one for me or a category very unexpected because, as I said, we didn't assume any kind of individual resistance, right, uh, with a few exceptions. But much less I expected to find actually physical self-defense. And uh, so this category kind of uh, contains uh, instances where, for example, um, uh, Jewish teen teenagers defended themselves from verbal or physical attacks from Hitler youth, uh, schoolmate, schoolmates, neighborhood kids, but also adult Jews who kind of fought off Nazi, uh, Nazis like stormtroopers, or sometimes even actually uh, initiated the brawl because, for example, in one case in Berlin, uh, the, there were two Jewish landladies and they were harassed by two stormtroopers who were tenants in their house. And uh, 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 one Jewish, young Jewish man kind of beat both of these stormtroopers up for the harassment. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the story in the chapter, or the main story, is of a 16-year-old uh, girl, Daisy Gronowski, and she is, as many teenagers at the time, um, she uh, goes to one of these retraining camps, as they called uh, um, Hachshara camps, where teenagers got agricultural education to be prepared for immigration, for example, to uh, Mandate Palestine. Uh, but also to Latin America, because uh, in many cases, somehow people who had agricultural knowledge were uh, received more openly, or this was often the only category that Jews were perceived, uh, received as immigrants or refugees. And so she is in a retraining camp in Western Germany near Cologne, um, uh, doing Kristallnacht. And uh, as in uh, many people don't know, uh, uh, not only shops and synagogues were actually um, destroyed uh, during the program, but also these retraining camps were raided by stormtroopers all over Germany. As, by the way, and this is my next book, uh, also uh, uh, Jewish homes were destroyed in large quantities. Yeah, So uh, uh, this is kind of an unseen side of Kristallnacht, which we have to dig more into. But uh, as I said, these retraining camps were uh, raided by stormtroopers, and they arrested the, uh, the the teachers, and then also often beat up the, the teenagers. And in her case, um, they not only beat up the male teenagers, but also the female teenagers. And she had, uh, in a, a kind of, when she was in Berlin before the retraining camp, she was a member of Hashomer Hatzair, a kind of leftist Zionist youth group, and uh, they, uh, and this is, was an interesting aspect for me, they uh, provided self-defense training to the Jewish kids. And she learned some jiu-jitsu Jiu -Jitsu tricks. And when one young stormtrooper, after beating up the, 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 the male teenagers, comes to her uh, in one hand a knife and started to kind of wanted to get a hold of her, she kind of head-butted, is it head-butting, kind of, she put her head into his stomach, and as she tells in her interview at the Shoah Foundation, and 
um, he kind of is irritated for a second. She twists out his knife and then she stabs him with his own knife. Uh, and uh, he becomes uh, unconscious, started bleeding, fell, uh, fall, uh, fell down. And this is what allows her to kind of to escape from this raid. And she is then arrested uh, again, but escapes again and uh, is fortunate to make it out to England uh, with one of the uh, transports uh, in the early, uh, at the end of 1938 and 1939 uh, via the Jewish community in Cologne. And uh, so she, this uh, story of Daisy Gronowski, she, by the end, uh, by the way, ended up in Los Angeles uh, uh, later on. Uh, so this is stands uh, uh, as representative for physical self-defense. Uh, is she still Jews. alive? Is she no, still alive? No, 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 she passed away, I think, in 2005 or something. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yes, these are these are amazing examples of of um, brave resistance, individual resistance that you describe here. Um, how many other ordinary Jews in Germany did similar things to resist persecution? Yeah, so this was also uh, really uh, eye opening for me. Um, there are two responses to your answer. First. Hundreds. So I have like hundreds and hundreds of cases. Uh, I couldn't tell them all. I buried many in the footnotes of my book just to mention the names. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, not only uh, very many, uh, but and I have to say my capacity over the 12 years was limited. I'm a one man show. So I didn't go to uh, to archives, for example, in let's say, uh, big cities, like I wasn't in the archive in Cologne, for example. I was uh, not in archives in Schwerin. Or, so there are many archives still to kind of be investigated. So that's one. Others uh, uh, didn't left, leave traces, what we know from in interviews in the Shoah Foundation. So for example, Daisy Gronowski's case didn't leave a trace in the archive. It was an interview that I came across. Yeah. So so there was a, is a large number of unknown hidden cases still, although I have already so many. Um, and then the other uh, response is, or answer to this question is, in contrast to previous assumptions that uh, resistance is kind of depending on certain character uh, traits, right? Certain uh, conditions like maybe education or social status. Uh, there are whole theories about this, uh, mainly from psychologists. Um, uh, my research shows something very different. There are no patterns. It's blue collar workers, highly educated, uh, higher education people. It is wealthy people and it's poor people. It's um, people in rural areas as in big cities. And most of all, it's men, it's women at the same uh, kind of sample size as men. So there is no difference between women and men. Mm -hmm. And also interesting, it's not younger people only. It is actually across all ages. I found resistance acts from elderly people in the 1970s and 80s of their lives, as well as, as I mentioned, 16 year, year old um, uh, uh, Jews. So this, is, so this was really for me eye opening to see that it is not about tra uh, character traits, not about certain preconditions, that practically everybody uh, in the Jewish population was able to resist. And uh, uh, so it depended really much, very much on, as what I see, uh, on situations. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I also feel that uh, the increasing persecution. Uh, led to this kind of accumulation of anger and disgust. And then at some point it needed like a small thing that people snapped. Yeah, So you have those people, but then you have also people like Daisy Gronowski who rebelled for kind of several times. So there was not, she was not snapping, she was just rebelling. Yeah, because she was not giving in. Uh, and uh, although she was three times arrested, she's every time she escaped. And so that's kind of, another form of uh, kind of where people constantly are resisting. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what w- was it? You said snapped. You said uh, you mentioned uh, the, the, the 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 maybe the the, the Zionist Israeli later Israeli mentality of fighting back. It, what was it also a choice made? A matter of choice, a conscious oh, choice. Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, a snapping. I mean, more in the sense that there is accumulated anger, and then at some times it must. You must do something, and like in Hans Oppenheimer's case, he rationally made a choice and picked this uh, setting of fire alarms. Mm-hmm. This was yeah. So there was this accumulation of anger, but also a rational choice that he looked something. How can I harm? Uh, the Nazi state. And so uh, I think you are totally right. It is a rational choice. And we have to also admit, for us in a democratic society, uh, this is often not really kind of understandable how much choices actually matter there, because they knew what they got themselves into. They knew they will be punished. They have seen other Jews being punished and go to jail for something similar. So they knew when they would do something, there will be repercussions. And not only for them as individuals, but also maybe for their families, maybe for their friends, maybe for their neighbors. So a choice really uh, uh, had to be made and also made on a constant basis. So for those who rebelled every time, I had an interesting discussion with the last remaining American in Rwanda. And I asked him, he saved uh, kind of uh, Tutsi orphans. So I asked him, uh, you go out every, uh, so you went out every day and trying to find Tutsi children and to save them. And he said, no, I had to make, I had to be really careful uh, uh, and see if the conditions were right to do this. Otherwise I stayed home. And then I said, yeah, but then you, uh, other these children, you couldn't save them and they were in danger. And he said, yeah, but I couldn't uh, kind of put the same the children I already saved in danger. So these are really considerations yeah. people yeah. had to make uh, also in Nazi Germany, uh, uh, was it worth to, uh, to to rebel? How was the best way to rebel? And so, so that's also why people acted very differently, destroying, kind of ripping down Nazi flags, writing a petition, or an anonymous leaflet, right? I, I wanted to say that as we're going to come talking about what the meaning is for today, the one of the things that our show hopes to do is to get people to speak up now instead of waiting until it gets to the kind of situations where these Jews were really, how should I say this, in a bad place when they had to be brave. And I think that your book is so important because I have always wondered why no one in Germany, why German Jews didn't earlier say anything. So apparently they did, and it's just not known so I thank you personally for your research because it's very important. Evelyn, did you have another question before? Yes, we... yes, yes. Can, can I, before you start, uh, sorry for interrupting, can I uh, just make a comment to what you, uh, Phyllis, what you just said? Uh, so it is really so that in the moment the Nazis take power, the first uh, critic, uh, vo- critical voices are heard and also punished. So uh, because you remember there was this wave of terror in 1933 in the first yes. weeks, and uh, in March already, 1933, the first Jews go on trial because they publicly criticized uh, kind of that Jews were beaten up, that uh, political prisoners were put into these wild concentration camps. So it starts in the minute they take power. But, uh, and, and the other thing what I wanted to say is, uh, throughout this research, I found another very interesting aspect, which I didn't kind of, um, let's say, go more in depth into into my book, because this would be another book. I found an equal amount of, for example, public protest of non-Jewish Germans against the persecution of the Jews, which is also totally unexpected. So in these police logbooks, where I, which I mentioned in the very beginning, which put me up on this whole thing, um, I found also non-Jewish Germans who were pro- uh, protesting against the um, Jew- anti-Jewish legislation, the treatment of Jews, and they equally were put on trial and they were went to jail for this. Yeah. So this is another whole side where, and I think this is exactly what leads us to today, that at the time, it is not what usually is said, everybody was indifferent. That's just not true. And in my, from my knowledge, from 
institutional persecution, how people reacted, one could not be indifferent in Nazi Germany. You can't be indifferent in a dictatorship. It's just not possible because every time, every day, people ask you to take sides. Yeah, when you are at your workplace, they ask you to go to a Nazi meet, a kind of party meeting, or to kind of to participate in a Nazi demonstration, or to say okay that they expel your Jewish uh, workmate. Yeah, so every day you have to take sides and take position, and I think this is something also really important, which then reads you have also non-Jewish Germans had to make choices every day. Yeah, and I it's, think it's... this. It's important that you dis that you document that for us and um, and 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 explain that to us in your in your, hopefully your next book because we we stand sometimes for the same kind of choices. But before we come to that, what was the effect of this resistance, this individual resistance, this resistance by ordinary individuals, Jews, non-Jews? Yeah, so it, it's interesting. I mean, it's, um, I have to say, and uh, it now sounds like this is all kind of, I found this in the archives and it was, uh, although it took a long while, it was really a difficult research. Often the traces of these uh, acts of resistance are tiny. It is half a page in a, poli a police logbook or one page indictment or two pages indictment in, uh, in court records. Um, so that's really difficult, and often there is not much more of what you can see. However, what I can say is that um, before I started this research, I was noting that in official reports of the Nazis, like Gestapo uh, reports, administrative reports, there was always this mentioning of the so-called impudent Jew. And I always thought the impudent Jew is mentioned because this is legitimizing, justifying the introduction of new harsher measures, right? But now with my research, I realize uh, actually, and I have some kind of connections there, that these, the, the mentioning of the impudent Jew is actually referring to, his, to these individual acts of resistance. So there was a base for this. However, yeah. the, the negative uh, kind of uh, reaction was that this sometimes led to harsher measures. Yeah, the, the, the resistance. Uh, sometimes it leads to the uh, kind of repetition of measures. So for example, in Berlin, there was in during the war, uh, um, uh, a limitation of uh, uh, the time when Jews could go grocery shopping to one hour in the afternoon. And a lot of Jews didn't respect uh, these regulations and they were caught or denunciated. So the, uh, uh, the city government, uh, the police uh, chief had to reissue uh, kind of and kind of threaten people that they need to kind of, uh, kind of uh, obey to these rules. Yeah, so you have these kind of reactions towards the, uh, the, the uh, uh, resistance. And then in some cases, um, uh, but this is, only true for Vienna, that in Vienna, sometimes um, uh, Jews were directly put on uh, deportation trains during the war instead of putting them on trial. But this was more the exception of the rule, which was also interesting uh, that the legal system was still working and it was not as sometimes uh, as assumed when Jews would uh, resist, they would just put in the concentration camp. This was not how it, how it worked in Nazi Germany. This is, can be true for occupied territories like Poland, but not in, in Nazi Germany. So it was really interesting in this case that sometimes when Jews were put on trial, even in 1941, there were acquittals of Jews, which really? we also couldn't imagine. Yeah, there were acquittals. So judges where, where this was, uh, they also had to make choices. And sometimes they said witnesses weren't, were not credible or they had some kind of sympathy for uh, uh, Jews. Um, so they were acquittals late in Can I war. ask a clarification? Were, at this point, were they only people's courts or did they have both the real legal courts plus people's courts? So there are three types of courts. In, uh, and most of my sources come from, uh, actually, and this is even more interesting in this case, from uh, the so-called special courts. They were introduced in 1933 by the Nazis 
to punish political enemies. And we never thought looked at their records because we thought this was just for communists and social democrats. But this is where many of my, they uh, uh, say my, the rebellious Jews kind of surface in these special court records. But then cases like Hans Oppenheimer, they were not tried in special courts, they were tried in regular courts, like local courts, regional courts. And only a few were tried in people courts in Berlin when they perceived uh, were perceived as treason. Uh, and this is then the case of uh, Bruce uh, uh, Brun, uh, Benno Neuberger, because um, uh, he wrote these uh, kind of uh, uh, postcards which were publicly uh, accessible uh, with the ins uh, in, uh, insulted Hitler. So that's more the exception of the rule, I have to say. So okay. regular courts, regular judges had to kind of deal with these cases. And uh, as I said, they have to had to make choices too. Some of them were very anti-Semitic, but still working in this legal frame. Yeah. So there so, were some some small victories, and they kept the system busy somewhat um, with their resisting acts and yeah. made people informed people, in fact, about what the injustice that was going on. Yeah, Phyllis. I just want to say that we're really coming close to the end. So what I'd like to give you is a chance to say last thoughts, but also if you could include in the last thoughts, any thoughts that you have about what this means for us today. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, the main lesson from this book is that um, it's really simple. If Jews were able, man, woman, young and old, were able to resist against one of the most fierce kind of and terrible uh, dictatorships uh, in, in history, then everybody can do this. So there's no kind of excuse to say, oh, I'm not able to do this. You need something special for this. Or, uh, so that's kind of just gone, yeah, I think, with my research. Um, the second is all uh, the second argument is I think or the second factor is that also uh, it is matters when you speak up early if when you resist early because what I didn't mention is that many of those Jews who resisted early they actually saved their lives by doing this because when they went to jail they usually right after the jail they left the country there yeah? so that was uh, kind of important so. In two ways, this was important for the Jews to speak up very early. So you can't wait till things play out. Uh, you need to uh, kind of resist in various ways, wherever you are, at your workplace, uh, uh, um, in your neighborhood. At the moment, one sees and notices discrimination. And this is true for all kinds of discrimination because uh, uh, these kind of regimes they act again, not just against one group, right? They are always kind of discriminating and persecuting several groups. And so there, uh, there's no excuse one kind of do something and one has to do it early. Thank you. I'm gonna, we repeat that at the end of every podcast and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it especially strongly here. So thank you so much for this informative interview and thank our guests for listening and those of you who want to know more about Evelyn or myself or our projects, you can go to Never Again Is Now podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And as our guest just said, now is the time without putting yourself in physical harm to speak up against anti-Semitism and all hate.